actually, I'm going to let Chrissy just, because she's going first, okay. I'm going to let her pull up her first Wait, like, whoever's going okay. first. Uh, I was just trying to work on mine the last <laughs> <laughs> I was trying, like, I should probably we have five more. minutes left, Erfan. Do you have any idea how much we can get done on a PowerPoint in five minutes? Come on. <laughs> I'm You're like right, scratching right. down all these notes to say. <laughs> all right, I'm going to hit the live Facebook. I'm hitting the live Facebook. I think it broadcasts from the moment I hit that. Do you know how many times I've used that smiley face to picture and presentations yeah, over the last like <laughs> 10 years? I've used it so many times. It's great. <laughs> Found that one with that little heart in it, you know, very, very loving. <clears throat> I like to use my second screen as my main screen. So it always looks like I'm looking off to the side. I need to which something. Winnie, what are you reading? Did I miss all the chit chat? Are we on now? Not quite. We have like three minutes, I think. I think we're being recorded, so don't say anything, oh, you know. Don't say anything. Crazy. <laughs> okay. All right. This is a very professional question. Airfon, the phone call I just got was about controlling thrips. Okay. It, uh, in an indoor um, environment, um, like in an office, where they are trying to grow leaf footed bugs. Huh. <laughs> That's very interesting. <laughs> so, so they have plants in there for the leaf-footed bugs, but thrips are infesting them. Interesting. Yes, it is very interesting. But I was like, Airfod will have some thoughts about uh, this. Paul might have some thoughts too. Or I would, but I'm currently just scramble brand right now. I can't okay. get it to go Facebook Live from this computer. Oh. Um, Let's see if I, if Becky, if I make, if I make you live, sorry, I have a um, master gardener training. I'm still kind of doing here. Um, <laughs> Becky, I'm going to make you the host and see if you're able to share. <clears throat> but I feel like we tried that before and it didn't work. To share what? But um, give it a, a Facebook share, Facebook share the thing. Oh, go live on Facebook. Should yeah, I yeah, share yeah. my screen right now? Is it easier if I don't share my screen so you can see stuff? I can definitely share to Aggie Turf and then y'all can just share from there onto other pages. Does that work? Yeah, that works. I think that makes sense for today anyway, since it's Turf Day. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. All righty. I'm going to tune y'all out. Rude. Come on, buddy. Poor Carlos is waiting in the Okay, I'm letting everybody in. And we're going to go live.
Hello, everyone. Hey, Carlos. Carlos. Okay. All right, we are now streaming live on the Aggie Turf Facebook page. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So, hi. Happy Thursday. Welcome to another episode of Chat with Green Aggies. You're joining us this week for Turf Grass Week. So we're going to talk all things turf today. Um, we're going to start off with my colleague, Dr. Seegers, here in just a minute, where she's going to share a little bit on the benefits of turf grass, which is something that's um, showing up more and more in some of our research, looking at ecosystem services of turf grass and trying to get a better understanding of what turf grass um, does for the environment and, and for um, our, our urban settings that we tend to find it in. Um, I want to start off by introducing um, our other panelists real quick. So, Laura, you're you're first on my screen. Okay. Hi, <laughs> Laura Miller, Texas a and AgriLife Extension Agent in Tarrant County. Uh, Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Winsky, and I'm a, a the um, uh, horticulture agent down here in Harris County. Uh, Carlos. I am uh, Carlos Bogran. I'm senior technical manager with OHP and here to represent industry in Texas as well. So um, several of our other panelists are actually not, not here today. Uh, Dr. Gu had another obligation, so she's not joining us right now. And then Dr. Vafai is um, in the middle of actually doing another program. So he'll join us here in just a little bit. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to my friend, Dr. Seegers, let her introduce herself and let her uh, go ahead and start her talk. All right, thanks, Dr. Bowling. So uh, like she said, I am Chrissy Siggers. I am the turf grass extension specialist located at the Dallas Center. So I thought that it would be interesting if we uh, kind of started off our spring season, I guess, um, with uh, benefits of turf grass. So I'll spend about 15 or so minutes talking about uh, what we get from turf grass. I know a lot of us are going to start planting very soon or redoing some of our areas very soon or start even mowing and fertilizing very soon. So let's talk about some of the benefits that we do get from turf grass. All right, well, this is a little blurrier than I thought it was gonna be, but hopefully you can still read it. Uh, but what I want you to see here is this is one of those kind of um, little charts that it, the more folks search for uh, benefits of grass or the more benefits that are out there on the internet, the largest, the, the larger the number is, or the, the, the word, sorry. Um, but you know, in turf grass, we sometimes get a bad reputation right? And so you might be thinking to yourself, well, sometimes turf grass uses too much water or they use too much fertilizer or too many chemicals. But hopefully through this Chat with Green Aggie series that we have done in the past and our future topics will show you that we don't need as much water or as much fertilizer or as much inputs as we really think. But if we appropriately manage these grasses in the way that they're meant to be, to be healthy and dense and a beautiful turf grass stand, then we're getting a lot of benefits from these grasses. So let's look at Texas turf grass by the numbers. Now, this is what I was able to pull offline off of either, um, you know, a reputable government site or a reputable study. And so turf grass not only contributes to the environment, it also strongly contributes to the economy. And so just in the state of Texas, which, you know, Texas is a very large state um, by land, and by people, of course, but an estimated $6 billion annually is contributed to the economy of Texas by the turf grass industry. So those are things like, you know, golf and sports and sod and uh, residential lawns as well, right? And so according to the USDA Ag Census, the most recent one released, we currently have approximately 56,407 acres of sod production in the state. And so that's contributing to a large amount of acreage, which also can, can help us contribute to um, number one, the economy and also the environment. Now this study was on golf courses, I think was released in 2017. So it might've ebbed and flowed a little bit, um, but on average, we have about 910 golf courses in the state of Texas. Now average 74 acres of managed turf grass per course, that's just the average. So if we're looking at that, 
golf courses contribute to about 67,340 acres of turf grass. And now this is a pretty large amount of acres, but this is not including like residential lawns. This is not included like park spaces or other recreational spaces such as um, sports fields and those things like that. So, all right. So um, when we start talking about turf grass benefits, we have three main categories. The first one we're going to talk about is functional benefits. And so these are you know, not all of the functional benefits that turf grass can give us, but they are some of the um, more highly touted or highly researched ones or, um, you know, maybe a little bit more beneficial to us than some of the other functional benefits that we might see listed. And so, you know, number one for functional benefit is really soil erosion. So having some type of ground cover such as turf grass on top of our soil really will cut down on the amount of loss, right? A loss of top soil is not something that we want to do. Um, so having a cover such as turf grass on top of your soil will really help reduce erosion. Um, we also see soil remediation, heat dissipation, especially important when we start talking about recreational benefits um, or urban environment benefits, you know, uh, dissipating heat, reducing noise, reducing glare, producing oxygen. Uh, I read a study somewhere where about a 50 foot by 50 foot area of turf grass can provide enough oxygen for a family of four for one day. And so, you know, at, like all of our plants, our turf grass is producing oxygen for us to breathe. Uh, carbon sequestration or storage is another big one. I've read some articles recently through some of our uh, universities that they've put out on how much carbon can a turf grass plant by acre acreage take out of the environment. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. But also groundwater, um, removing pollutants, uh, recharging our surface water, uh, changing our water quality is something that is also a huge benefit of uh, turf grass. So the first functional benefit we're going to focus on is the cooling effect. So turf grass is a super cool plant, haha, <laughs> no pun intended, um, but literally a super cool plant, right? So in general, turf grass can be considerably more cooler than these common surfaces listed here in this chart. Um, we can see it on average being about 15 degrees cooler than concrete, about 30 degrees cooler than our synthetic turf. And this can be done through the process of transpiration. So the process of transpiration has a cooling effect that lowers the temperature of the air around that turf grass plant. And so we have seen some studies out there showing that the amount of heat given off by either bare soil or either poorly maintained turf can be substantially more or greater than that of a well-maintained area of turf grass. And so, you know, not only a functional benefit, but it's gonna kind of move into our recreational benefits, right? And so if we're playing sports or we have our children playing out in a park on a natural grass versus something like bare soil, concrete, uh, asphalt, synthetic turf, we're gonna see a lot more benefits of, um, of the cooling aspect of turf grass. And so they won't get overheated or even in some cases burned if it's if it's a very hot day. And so um, huge benefit when we start talking about the cooling effect. Uh, one of the biggest functional benefits is carbon sequestration or storage. So like I said earlier, you know, turf grasses like all of our plants capture our atmospheric carbon dioxide and we use that in a process called photosynthesis. It helps us create usable energy in the form of carbohydrates and also oxygen production as well. And so I'm sure everyone on this call has heard about the increasing levels of atmospheric CO2 and it's associated with what we call the greenhouse effect or global warming, another term you might have heard. So turf grasses can actually act as a source of carbon storage, so removing or decreasing that atmospheric carbon. And so when we start talking about that, um, when we start thinking about 
the way a turf grass plant grows. We can see on this top image here, top right image, that most of our turf grass mass is, or biomass is gonna be below the ground. And so that's going to help our root mass and also organic matter development in that soil is gonna help us store that carbon. And so when we start thinking about how much does it actually store? So I have a few examples here. Um, I wrote this down. I was looking at a research article um, yesterday so some previous research has shown that we can store up to 2.27 tons of carbon per acre per, per year. Uh, now that is depending on the species of grass, of course, the soil texture, um, what you've used that land for in the past, uh, maybe your climate where you are, but up to 2.27 tons per acre per year. And so that's pretty cool. Um, also uh, have a, a few other um, figures for us. An average size healthy lawn is able to store a, a, about 300 pounds of carbon per year. And an average golf course fairway can store up to 1500 pounds of carbon per year. Now we used to have, well, we used to kind of have a, um, negative connotation when we started talking about carbon storage, when we started talking about management. And so we we're like, well, these turf grasses can store a lot of carbon, can remove a lot of carbon from the atmosphere, but some of our management practices might reduce that amount. So um, it's a consideration, but we, we, were, we were under the impression that mowing um, which uses fossil fuels as well as creation of some of our synthetic fertilizers will uh, reduce some of that carbon storage in our plant, but we have seen research over the years that has concluded that those practices like mowing, um, returning clippings, uh, fertilizing appropriately, feeding the plant with uh, fertilizer and water appropriately can actually increase our turf grass's ability to sequester carbon. So basically the healthier the plant, the more carbon we should be able to store. Now, you might say to yourself, well, 2.27 tons of carbon per year per acre might not sound like a lot to me, especially when humans per year are um, estimated to expend about 16 to 27 tons of carbon per person per year. But that doesn't take into account all of the area of turf grass we have. So if we have thousands, uh, millions of acres of turf grass throughout the US, it can help offset some of that atmospheric carbon. So it's pretty cool when you start thinking about how much turf grass and how the below the ground roots and the other kind of plant parts can contribute to uh, the reduction of atmospheric carbon. So pretty cool. Um, so next we're going to talk a little bit about recreational benefits. So some of the things that, you know, we see with recreational benefits is we have millions of people playing sports all over Texas and all over the US as well. And so uh, creating a safe playing surface for that uh, activity, whether it's golf or whether it's uh, football or whether it's you know, tennis, whatever, um, can provide uh, not only health benefits, but um, you know, uh, a lot of um, health benefits as well as environmental benefits when we're talking about re those recreational surfaces. Also community pride, you know, we love seeing green spaces that can add to our uh, property value, create a sense of pride in our community when we have healthy and beautiful areas, uh, therapeutic opportunities, and also an entertainment and economic benefit from that recreation. So let's talk a little bit about more safe playing surfaces. So. Here we have an example of football game. Um, there's a lot of events that go on on turf grass, whether or not it's recreational, competitive, but really the surface is the most important part. And so if we work to create a safe and playable and beautiful surface, then we can really see a benefit not only from the economy, not only from the environment, but also from the reduction of injuries. And so, um, this top photo here shows a guy that, you know, is getting tackled or has, has fallen in a way where he is 
his head is coming in contact with the plane surfaces. So based on some research done through some of our, uh, you know, NFL, um, NCAA, and some of our university researchers, we have found that about 15 to 20% of concussions in American football are related to the surface. And so um, if we are managing these grasses correctly, we can provide a cushion. We can provide a, a, a safe playable surface for the, these athletes. And so um, that's just an added benefit of natural turf grass. And then last but not least, the aesthetic benefit. Green space contributes to the overall quality of life. We have a ton of research that's been done out there where, um, you know, green space and being able to look out a window and being able to uh, take breaks in a green area with trees is, is beneficial for not only um, our mental health, but maybe some recovery from some of our uh, ailments. And so there's actually been some research and I didn't know that this study was out there, but there's been some research on um, the ability of uh, hospitalized patients and um, long-term care patients to have a greater quality of life and a, a shorter recovery time from some of their um, medical issues with the ability for them to either view a green space out of the hospital window or be able to go out into that green space there was also some quality of life surveys that were conducted. So in a quality of life survey that was conducted in Washington, about 95% of the respondents most wanted green grass and turf grass areas around them where they could either go out to those spaces or be able to visually see them from their office window. So that makes a lot of, a, uh, a lot of sense. So in addition to being attractive, we also do see those therapeutic benefits. And of course, the increase in property value, of, of course. So these benefits aren't free. We can't just put that turf grass out there and not do anything to it and expect to get all of these benefits. So these really depend upon proper turf grass management overall health of the plant. And of course, this can be dependent on many different characteristics. Each site is different. Every species and cultivar of grass will act differently. They need different things. So we have to work for these benefits, right? So the benefits aren't free. So some things we can control. Well, mowing, right? We can control how often, um, how high or low we mow. We can sharpen our leaf blade or our uh, mowing blades to make sure we're getting a good cut on our leaf blades. We can do proper cultural, cultural practices when needed, such as uh, decompaction, working on our soil, fertilizing properly, seeding properly, establishing our grasses properly, as well as irrigating properly. These are all management practices that we can control as the turf grass industry professional. And so if we're doing these, if we're doing these practices in the correct manner um, when needed and when necessary, not overdoing it, then we can see a lot of these benefits start coming from our turf grass. And so I think Dr. Bowling's gonna talk about establishment practices today and getting ready to kind of plant. And so when we start talking about those, establishing is so important, establishing correctly is so important, and then managing correctly for all of the benefits that we can get. So that's pretty much all that I have. Um, does, if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to shoot it in the chat. You can also um, shoot me an email anytime um, and we can talk about other things other than benefits or how cute my dog is, other than, you know, whatever you'd like to. So um, I, I'm done here. I don't see any questions coming in. So hopefully you enjoyed that and, and kind of trained your mind to think of beneficial aspects of turf grass rather than, oh, I have to go out there and mow my grass or, you know, what kind of benefits are we getting from doing these management practices? So um, thank you. And I will turn it over to Dr. Bowling. Awesome. Thanks, Chrissy. So next thing that we're going to talk about today is going to be kind of thinking about uh, site preparation for this spring. So let me get my PowerPoint up here. So could be a number of reasons that we're thinking about this uh, going into the season. We may see some degree of winter injury or winter kill in our warm season turf grass areas that warrant 
replacement either of a section of the turf like you see here or maybe even an entire turf grass area um, you know this program we primarily are, are catering to professionals and so in many cases you may be tasked with a turf grass renovation um, just as a function of that area is old it's just time or somebody's looking to make a conversion to a new species or cultivar and this is a picture of my yard uh, my husband and I moved up here about a year ago now and we have half of our yard is a really healthy dense St. Augustine grass and half of our yard is not as healthy not as dense Bermuda grass so you can see here it's struggling in these shaded areas um, underneath some of our trees and even out here in the main yard uh, during the growing season we see that the density is not great it's very sparse open common Bermuda grass we have a lot of Dallas grass infestation and so this is going to be kind of a project for us this year is replacing this half of our yard. So one of the first things that I kind of want to get you guys to think about, whether you're a professional or you're, you're a homeowner that's looking at doing this for your property, why are you replacing your turf grass area? Is it because it failed in some way? And if the answer to that is yes, we, we want to start by kind of asking ourselves this question of, why did it fail and how can I prevent this failure from happening again? So if the answer is yes and the, and the reason that it failed has to do with our winter storm, well, you know, there's only really so much that we can do about that. Um, we will have uh, next fall, we will do some uh, programs here on Chat with Green Aggies to talk about how to kind of prepare those areas um, for future winter storm events. Um, but, you know, other things that we may be looking at are uh, we may have a lot of shade. In our yard now you know a lot of times here in texas when we build a new home uh, the go-to builder option is going to typically be common bermuda grass and as the landscape evolves over time and the trees start to grow and fill in it's not going to be able to keep up with the shade that we're going to start to see in those landscapes and, and so as that landscape matures uh bermuda grass may not be the right option for me anymore so i may be looking to to kind of convert as a function of that I may be uh, seeing signs where the turf grass species or cultivar that I have can't tolerate the amount of traffic that's on it. So if I manage a park facility, school grounds facilities, uh, or even if I have a backyard that I've got a bunch of big dogs playing in it, I may be seeing issues there with the turf being able to, to hold up. Um, I also may just see in general um, that my turf grass species cultivar is not tolerating biotic or abiotic stresses that, that seem to be kind of recurring issues in my landscape. And so this is where too we may ask questions about, am I having issues with a particular disease? Are there other cultivars that are going to be more resistant to this disease? So, you know, for example, in the case of St. Augustine grass, we see a lot of times uh, breeding priorities are going to include uh, some, some resistance to chinch bugs. Um, some resistance to certain common diseases like gray leaf spot. Doesn't mean that it's immune completely to having those problems, but we do see that genetically we have some cultivars that, that are able to be a little bit more resilient in the face of those things. I also want to take some time to kind of think about, is my turf grass failing as a function of the soil management? Is there a failure here because my soil is extremely compacted and I just, you know, maybe I've tried to aerate a few times, but I'm just not really able to get the results that I want. And so now I've got a failure. Um, is my soil problematic because the quality of my water is really poor? I'm dealing with a sodic water source with that's high in bicarbonates and the structure of my soil has significantly declined or diminished over time. I also want to think about, you know, in some cases we just have really old yards, you know, here in Texas it's not uncommon for us to have 40, 50 year old yards and just as a function of time and, and maybe fluctuations in management and a really intense weed uh, showing up, we may just have severe infestations of pests or weeds or whatever. Um, you know, in the case of my yard, Dallas grass is something I have to address. It's very common for me to see in, in certain turf grass systems, uh, sand burr infestations that really take a toll over time and they just kind of get out of hand. And so those are things I want to think about too. I also want to take the time to think about whether or not I've had issues with surface uniformity. So Chrissy just talked about the importance of this, this continuity of surface. And in the case of some of our turf grass systems, we may see recurring issues where 
the undulations, the changes in slope across my area are leading to constant problems where I've got low spots where I always have disease. I always have certain beads. I just constantly, it's a big, mucky, muddy mess. And so these are the times where I can kind of think about while I'm already in there and I'm making this swap, do I need to go ahead and make some of these corrections? I also want to think about other renovations to consider while I'm, while I'm in here doing this work. You know, those of you that live uh, in parts of central Texas may be really familiar with the challenges of soil depth, knowing that a lot of the soils that we have in that part of the state may have two, three inches of really viable soil that's pretty rocky to begin with, and then we hit solid bedrock. And that's creating a kind of a constant challenge for me in terms of getting root depth and really being able to sustain my turf. So there may be questions here about, do I need to take steps to increase my root zone depth by bringing in more soil? Uh, do I need to modify my irrigation system in any way? So, you know, same idea with, with landscapes that are maturing, evolving over time, what once might have made sense in terms of how our irrigation system was designed may no longer make sense. And so while I've already got the soil exposed to do this new planting, that's a good time um, to maybe have that irrigation system audited to look at uh, what, what changes might I need to make here while I've already got this up. And then again, slope grading corrections that I may need to make um, just as me watching over time, the way water moves across the property, um, do, I, do I need to get in there and try to make some changes while I can? So a lot of times, you know, when we're thinking about site preparation, I like, to, I like to think of things in terms of kind of a sequential order or a checklist. We're not going to go into all of these today because those of you that are professionals, you know, a lot of this is going to be a very much review. So I'm going to try to focus on things where I can integrate in some research that's out there to help you maybe make some of the more challenging decisions this year. Um, but one of the first things that we want to focus on, of course, is selecting an appropriate turf grass, right? Not getting too comfortable defaulting to what we've always used before. Again, it comes back to recognizing maybe what, what caused failure and also taking time to see what's new. We have a lot of new turf grasses on the market, in, especially in the Bermuda and zoysia grass categories. And so we want to kind of stay up to date on that. Think about whether or not some of these new cultivars might not be a better fit for some of these renovations. Uh, we want to identify a good planting date, right? So, you know, Chrissy's done some talks and she's, she's put together a publication that, that uh, will come out uh, talking about dormant sodding and why as much as we can help it, we want to avoid dormant sodding. We also, you know, to the best of our ability, we want to avoid planting in the middle of August, the hottest, driest part of the year. We want to concentrate on planting, you know, for many of our warm season grasses, this kind of late spring, early summer window where I have optimal temperatures to support new growth. I'm getting some natural rainfall. I'm not in the hottest, driest part of the year. I'm not in the coldest part of the year. And I have a nice window there to really get established. Um, also kind of keep in mind that some of our species and some of our cultivars take longer to establish than others. So whereas we may see, you know, Bermuda grass is looking really good in about two, three months time, uh, zoysia grasses can take a lot longer sometimes to establish depending on the cultivar. And um, so kind of keeping that in the back of our mind as well. We do, of course, want to test the soil. I'll talk about that more here in just a second. Whether you're re replanting or renovating or you're just maintaining your established turf, this is a good time of year to test the soil. We want to make sure that we measure the lawn area appropriately. We want to take those steps to eliminate existing grasses and weeds. We want to do everything we can to prepare the soil. This is a really, really important component that oftentimes gets overlooked. The success of our turf grasses is really, really dependent on what's happening below what we can see in the soil. And so really taking time to put a little effort into that and really be mindful about that is really important. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people go out and just lay new sod on top of old sod. And so we don't wanna do that. We wanna take the time to properly clear existing vegetation, take the time to prepare the soil, make amendments as we feel it seems appropriate um, before we plant anything new. Uh, again, we wanna consider, you know, 
installation, renovations, or auditing of the existing irrigation system to make sure that everything's going to work smoothly on that end. And we want to ensure that the soil is relatively settled before we plant. You know, good rule of thumb, we, we don't want to plant on a compacted soil, but we do want our soil to be uh, somewhat firm because if you plant on loosely packed soil, if I'm laying sod on loosely packed soil, I'm gonna end up as it settles over time, getting these ruts and kind of divots in my surface. So I want it to be fairly firm, even, uniform. I wanna do what I can to remove any big bulky rocks that may inhibit rooting. Um, so those are all things that I wanna do as well. Now, first thing I do wanna reiterate is the importance of soil testing. This is a big thing. If you've seen me do programs before, I always harp on this because it's a really big uh, passion of mine. When we don't take the time to test the soil and customize our nutrient management program, we're much more likely to over apply nutrients or in some cases we may not be applying uh, the right the right formulation, the right uh, chemical form of a nutrient, or we may be, uh, maybe don't apply micronutrients, not realizing that that's actually what we really need. And so we want to make very informed des decisions about the fertilizers that we use, recognizing that increasingly urban systems are recognized as the primary contributors to nutrient pollution in our surface and groundwater resources. That it's no longer these rural farming areas that they feel are really contributing to excessive nitrogen and phosphorus contamination of our water. It's lawns. It's things that we're maintaining in the urban landscape. It's the over application of fertilizers. In many of our Texas soils, we do not need to apply phosphorus and potassium. And so we want to make sure that we're getting this soil test performed in addition to giving us a sense of the nutrients that are in my soil. It's also going to tell me something about my soil pH. It's going to tell me something about my salinity. And so all of these things can be really useful in designing an informed program. Okay. <clears throat> so again, when I have those soil test results well in advance of the season, then it allows me to make some strategic decisions. In some cases, it may be appropriate to uh, incorporate or apply certain nutrients prior to planting. And we don't typically recommend this in the case of nitrogen. Nitrogen is super dynamic. It moves and transforms very quickly in the soil. And so even once we plant our new sod, seed, whatever it is, for, for a while at the beginning of that establishment period, we're going to be spoon feeding that nitrogen on in much smaller amounts because we don't have the root system yet to take up a full application of nitrogen. But in the case of other nutrients like phosphorus, we do want to make sure that we have sufficient phosphorus there. It's a really important nutrient in supporting new root growth. And so that is one in particular we want to keep an eye on when we're thinking about pre-plant. Uh, we also want to take the time to see whether or not I need to do any amending of that soil to uh, correct pH imbalances. Now, turf grass, you know, many of our warm season turf grasses tolerate a decent pH range, so they're not going to be as particular as some of the other horticultural plants that we may sometimes work with. Um, but when we get too acidic or too alkaline, we can certainly start to see uh, issues with nutrient availability of certain, you know, the availability of certain nutrients. And so those are things that we may want to correct. Similarly, we want to recognize if there's uh, whether or not there's a salinity issue on the property that we're talking about. And so a lot of times this is going to be reflected too in, in the irrigation water quality. If you are managing a facility where um, they're using well water, retention pond water, reclaimed or recycled water, or even in some cases potable water where the quality is questionable, we do want to take the time to also test that water and think about how that fits into our bigger plan. So a couple of things I wanted to talk about in terms of clearing out existing vegetation. The first is just some things to keep in mind when you're doing a turf conversion. So when I'm swapping from one species to another species, I want to recognize that there are uh, morphological differences in these grasses that have an impact on kind of the, the approach that we might take to remove them from a site. Um, and so we may divide our grasses kind of loosely into these four categories. Bunch type grasses are gonna to refer to those grasses that do not produce stolons and rhizomes. They're not gonna stretch their arms out all over the areas that they're growing in. They just form cute little tufts 
of grass. When they thin out, we reseed to allow them to fill back in. A lot of our cool season grasses are gonna fall into this category. So tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, annual ryegrass, annual bluegrass, okay? Then we have stoloniferous grasses. These are grasses that exclusively produce stolons, or you may know it by the term uh, uh, runners, and these are going to be above ground lateral stems. You know, they're going to be those, the, they're going to typically have green tissue on them, and they're going to facilitate lateral movement of those grasses. And so uh, creeping bent grass, centipede grass, buffalo grass, and St. Augustine grass in particular are stoloniferous, okay? This is going to be important here in a minute, and I'll explain why. Then we have our rhizomatous grasses. These are going to be grasses that form uh, lateral stems in the soil below ground, Kentucky bluegrass, Bahia grass, and Johnson grass. Then we have this final category of grasses that do both, okay? Uh, Bermuda grass and zoysia grass in particular, these are going to be two of the three most commonly planted grown grasses here in the state of Texas. These grasses have the capacity to develop lateral stems both above and below ground. So they produce both stolons and rhizomes. What this means for me is that if I wanna get rid of Bermuda, I'm not gonna be able to go out there and just till it into the ground and make it go away. If I take a Bermuda grass rhizome and I cut it up into six pieces, all I'm gonna do is make six new little Bermuda grass plants, okay? so. Recognizing that because of some of the different structures that these grasses have, it may take more effort, it may take different approaches to really successfully remove them from a site in order to make way to plant something new. So if I'm, if I'm making that conversion from something like Bermuda grass to St. Augustine grass, I'm probably going to have to consider the use of a non-selective herbicide and probably multiple applications of a non-selective herbicide that is systemic, that has the ability to translocate into the roots, into the rhizomes of that Bermuda grass to help um, control it, remove it, kill it. Or I'm gonna be talking about a combination of that with something like really intensive sheet mulching, which is, is you know, if you're looking for an alternative to traditional uh, herbicides, uh, that, that's gonna be an option is that you could look at sheet mulching but it is gonna be a more time consuming process. It's also one where we're gonna have some expectation management about how much it's really gonna remove. And even when, you know, I'm sure Chrissy will say the same thing that, that when we've made this kind of conversion for research and we've gone out to clear a Bermuda grass area, we may make three applications of a non-selective herbicide really attempting to, you know, get rid of that. And still it'll pop up after we plant our new St. Augustine or whatever it is. It can be very challenging to remove. And so kind of having a plan for that based on the types of grasses that you're trying to clear out. I also wanted to talk a little bit about herbicides here. So if you join us for our winter injury talk, we talked about some of the cautions around using pre-emergence herbicides this year. We talked about it from the, the, the standpoint of um, thinking about turf grass recovery. The other way we need to think about it is if we do have to replace turf grass areas or we choose to replace turf grass areas, we want to be mindful of the fact that pre-emergence herbicides can interfere with the establishment of new turf grass, whether we're planting it as seed or sprigs or sod. So this was a, a study conducted by a couple of colleagues of mine at Mississippi State, um, where they looked at several different pre-emergence herbicides and their impact on turf grass establishment. And that you'll see down here at the bottom of this image, it says, that the Y indicates herbicide treatments that increased days to reach 50% hybrid Bermuda grass cover. So these were herbicides that they identified as, um, as, as having an impact on the rate of establishment, the rate of coverage. And you'll see that nearly all of these have that little Y next to them. Okay, and a lot of that has to do with the site of action, the mode of action, the manner in which those herbicides work. What you'll see down here is when we go to oxidize on G, we don't see that impact, okay? Similarly with atrazine, we may not see an impact either, but there's some other concerns that come with using atrazine as a pre-emergence herbicide here in Texas. It's not typically gonna be a go-to option for us. Um, so we're focused primarily on oxidizon. Similarly, similarly, another study that was conducted in 1983 also saw excellent root growth on three different Bermuda grasses following a 1x rate of oxidizon. Um, those of you that are watching that are professionals, you may also know this product by the common name Ronstar. There's several different formulations of it. But one thing that we want to keep in mind 
is that this is not a product that's labeled for use by homeowners, and this is not a product that's labeled for use on home lawns. So if you're watching and you fall more into that category, unfortunately, this product is not going to be an option for you. This is going to be something that can be utilized in other professional turf grass settings, um, in those instances where they're we want a pre-emergent. We don't want to see the, the delay in green up our establishment from using some of our other pre-emergent products. Any herbicides that we choose to use in this process of preparing for new planting, we want to take time to really pay close attention to the label. A lot of times there are going to be pretty specific recommendations for a, a window of time, both before and after planting, where it's safe to use this product. And so we want to look for those windows and that language on our product label um, before we use anything like that, rec recognizing that even in some cases, I may put my pre-emergent herbicide out for some of these products and I may think, oh, it's fine. You know, two months have passed. I'm going to go ahead now and put out my seed for my new turf or sprig my new turf. Well, that pre-emergent herbicide may still have residual activity that's still going to inhibit the establishment of what you plant two months later. And so really paying close attention to that label and thinking about that when you're putting your plan together. Same kind of idea when we're talking about post-emergence herbicides, um, paying close attention to soil residual activity. So we have a number of non, you know, we have a couple of non-selective um, uh, uh, systemic herbicides that um, are going to really help us clear out vegetation ahead of time um, that aren't going to have soil residual activity. So they're not going to inhibit the growth of anything new that we plant. So these are all kind of things that we want to think about. You also have the option of using mechanical tools to help you in, in removing existing vegetation. So not uncommon to see people rent this walk behind sod cutter or to have this in their uh, box of tools that they use for their landscape company or, or whatever it is. Um, this can be really helpful for going out and kind of removing that uppermost layer of vegetation. Um, and then especially in the case of some of our you know, strictly stoloniferous grasses, something like a St. Augustine, this could put a real dent in removing that grass because it doesn't have those rhizomes there in the soil to recover from this kind of mechanical injury. Um, in the case of Bermuda grass or zoysia grass, remember that even if I go in and I cut that grass out like sod, I'm still gonna have those rhizomes in the soil that could come back. So I'm looking at maybe a combination of this and other, other uh, methods of, of veg suppressing that vegetation, killing off that vegetation that comes up out of the soil after I've removed what's above ground. Okay. I also wanted to introduce some of my professionals on here to this idea of phrase mowing. If you're not familiar with this topic, um, this is something that's become increasingly popular in particular in sports field environments. Um, situations where we have a flat continuous surface and, and like Chrissy said we're really trying to maintain optimal quality of that surface. Um, this is becoming more and more kind of an option for helping to do that. It has some benefits from the standpoint of removing thatch. The other thing that's kind of cool about it um, that we're looking at at one of my research projects that I'm on, I'm not on this particular component, but it's part of a big grant that I'm on, is you can actually use this as a way of removing um, seed banks that accumulate in those uppermost layers of soil. And so uh, over here on the right is uh, 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 an article that came out um, and there's the link to the magazine there. So this is an article that came out about using this practice for annual bluegrass control, where they go in and they, uh, they phrase mow at different depths and, and use it as a way of removing that annual bluegrass seed bank that may accumulate there over time. So if you're working in a, in a big facility, uh, maybe you work on school sports field or public parks, rec sports field, whatever it is. And you also, in addition to needing to kind of do some, you know, renovation to that surface, you also recognize that you have a persistent weed issue. Um, and, and in particular, annual weeds where you have a dense seed bank that's forming. Um, this could be another practice that you kind of explore to help um, kind of re hit the reset button on some of that. Um, that kind of leads me to this other form of mechanical preparation for new sites, which is the idea of tillage. And so, you know, a lot of times when we're thinking about planting new turf grass areas, we really want to strive to have 
at least six to eight inches of a really solid uh, root zone for new roots to form. Recognizing that some of these turf grasses, when they have everything they need, can root 10, 12 feet into the soil. So we don't want to get too fixated on just the upper couple of inches. We want to try to have a nice, deep area for these grasses to root. And in many of our urban soils, compaction can become an issue over time. And getting in there with mechanical cultivation, like tilling, when we're in transition and we're preparing to plant something new can be beneficial at kind of breaking up some of that compaction and improving the structure of our soil. However, there is a study out there that was done uh, looking at this in a little bit more detail. And I want to share some of those findings with you guys. So this study in particular looked at the effects of tillage and compost combined. So they had uh, three different tillage treatments and four different compost rates and they looked at different uh, intersections of those treatments to kind of see what really seems to work when we're talking about supporting turf grass establishment, both in the short and the long term. And one of the, some of the things they indicated were that um, compost amended plots uh, consistently sustained the greatest and highest quality turf cover. And, you know, in the case of plots that received no tillage, no compost, they saw that after planting, the quality of those areas dropped significantly and remained pretty much unacceptable over time. So when we don't take any steps, you know, to, to prepare that soil prior to planting something new, we may see yeah, it looks okay for a while and then it just really starts to decline, especially if we know that we may have some compaction issues, which are going to be pretty common in a lot of our urban soils. Here's another one. It says the tillage only treatment decreased to an unacceptable level within about a year of this trial starting. And to them, that suggested that tillage alone without the addition of organic matter was not sufficient to really provide these long-term benefits to soil structure and bulk density. And so their kind of consensus was that if you really want to have the best setup for turf grass establishment, you're talking about a combination of some mechanical control as well as the addition of a high quality organic material or compost material. Um, and you get some additional benefits to that as well, which I'll talk about here in a second. But um, here they, they found that the greatest benefit came from the highest rate of compost. So when you're not shy about the compost, they did see with the compost emitted plots, there was a little bit of a delay initially with establishment as a function of the carbon to nitrogen ratio in that material. But once those effects wore off in the long term, they saw the greatest benefits from, from doing a little bit of pre-plant tillage and incorporate, incorporating in a high quality organic material. So this is something that we really wanna think about um, whenever we're, we're preparing to, to plant new turf. This is another study that was conducted uh, back in 2001 um, where they actually compared the subsoil that they were talking about, and then what the composted biosolids that they were using in this study had to offer from a nutrient standpoint. So you can see there certainly from a nutrient standpoint, there's a big difference in terms of what was there in the soil and what was being added as a function of the type of organic material they were using. Now, we don't see necessarily these very high nitrogen rates with every compost material. These are biosolids, so it's a little bit different type of material. Um, you'll also see a pretty significant difference there in terms of the pH. So in this case, they were dealing with an alkaline subsoil, which is what we often deal, deal with here in Texas, and the compost material that they were bringing in was more acidic. So this is not only going to add nutrients to the soil profile, but it's going to potentially increase the availability of those nutrients by lowering the pH. Okay, um, This was some of the data that they collected where they actually looked at the impact of the compost amended soils using these biosolids on turf grass establishment. They were focused primarily on cool season grasses, but you, if you go and you look at these numbers, you can certainly see that in many cases there was significantly more rapid, better establishment in those soils that were amended with compost compared with those that weren't. So again, kind of advocating for um, this idea of bringing in organic material. A couple little uh, kind of closing thoughts on this compost argument before we move on to my last little bit here is um, nutrient concentrations in the soil tend to increase in response to uh, compost uh, addition, particularly, you know, one thing we want to kind of keep in the back of our mind is that not all composts are created equal. Right, so we're going to see variability in terms of the composition of compost material, the pH, the nutrient availability. So these are all things that we probably want to have a handle on 
um, before we add a compost, recognizing that some composts may not offer us as many benefits as others. Um, turf grass growth and quality tend to be increased as a result of amending soils with compost. This was found in several studies that I looked at. And when they also saw a significant difference in bulk density that they feel could support the development of new roots. And so instead of having these really dense, compacted soils, when we're incorporating these compost materials into, for example, a denser clay soil, we may see that it kind of lightens that soil to where it really supports more vegetative growth. In the case of a sandy soil, we may see that the incorporation of compost helps with water holding capacity and nutrient retention. So a lot of benefits all the way around. I also did want to talk briefly about expanded shale. So this is a, another kind of way to amend our, in particular, our heavy clay soils, where there's been some, some research done um, here in Texas on some of our more challenging soils. So expanded sh uh, shale is going to be clay or shale um, that's heated in a rotary kiln and until it becomes a light porous ceramic aggregate. So I like to think of it as kind of like a clay popcorn, like we've just heated it up so much and now it's kind of this, this light uh, puffy thing that we can incorporate in. And, and several studies have found that when we incorporate this into our heavy clay soils, we are gonna see an increase in our uh, hydraulic conductivity or, or kind of the infiltration rates in those soils. So many of us know that when we're dealing with really heavy clay soils, um, we can see a lot of challenges sometimes with getting water to infiltrate or move into those soils. And so in addition to some compost material, this can be another option as well for helping to improve the structure of those soils um, and, and helping to improve uh, infiltration. The, this particular study also found that um, the expanded shale, similar to, to the compost studies, decrease the density of the clay samples, and they felt that, that this benefits vegetative growth and, and root, uh, root development. So a lot of benefits there. That's the bulk of what I got. I did want to make just one other kind of statement or, or something to have in the back of your mind, which is um, when we go out and we look at uh, amending soils in any way, we always want to make sure we do our due diligence and do our research. I get a lot of people that have a tendency, they want to incorporate sand into our shrinking swelling clays, thinking that it'll help with infiltration and it doesn't. It has the opposite effect where it actually turns those soils into concrete. So we wanna be really mindful about that. I'll also see that in some cases with our coarser textured soils here in the state, we get people that try to add some kind of topsoil on top of those sandy soils hoping that it'll kind of enrich that soil. But when we add a finer textured soil on top of a really sandy soil, we actually end up having issues with water movement. We end up creating kind of a perched water table where water just kind of sits in that upper layer of, of finer soil that I've added and it doesn't move through and support uh, movement and root growth into the subsoil. Um, and, and likewise, you know, when we're planting new sod, if I'm in a part of the state, if I'm in a part of Texas where my soils tend to be pretty sandy, I may, be, may want to do the extra legwork to find a sod farm that grows sod on sand. And we do have them here in the state of Texas. Or a sod farm that, that I can pay a little extra to get washed sod. So that again, I'm not putting a, a layer of really heavy clay on that sod on top of my very coarse sandy soil. So those are just some things to think about. Um, I don't know if we have any questions. I'm gonna invite our other panelists to turn their camera back on and join me because I'm feeling lonely right now here on our, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if we have anything else we wanna talk about in terms of turf preparation or if any of you guys have additional thoughts. Um, that we want to add before we've got a little bit of time so um but um yeah <laughs> all right you might got any questions or anything so, you just found interesting huh anything you just found really interesting <laughs> I, I, haven't think, seen that, I haven't seen that uh, mowing uh, to remove the, the seed bank. Mowing? That, yeah, that was pretty, pretty cool. cool. Yeah, it's pretty and, cool. And uh, 
I wanted to ask you, what would what do they do with that material afterwards? Oh, that's a good question, Carlos. I'm not sure what they did with the material in this particular study. Chrissy may know because she's worked a lot with the sports field guys. I don't know what they do with all that. Yeah, so I guess it depends. Um, if it depends on why you're renovating. So if you're renovating to get rid of a bunch of weeds, they probably just do away with that material. But uh, I have seen some sports fields that will use that material to replant another field because it is removing a lot of that material that will grow. And so I guess it's just, it just- It's kind of like sprigs. You're like making yeah. little sprigs. <laughs> Basically making little sprigs, but I have seen them just put it in a, you know, like a compost pile or something like that as well, just to- get rid of it but yeah it's a very interesting um practice especially yeah. if you've got time for it to regrow very interesting yeah, yeah. and i will and I say see, you know hot spots you know like uh not sage hot spot you know mm -hmm. where where uh, maybe you know that's the only solution for long term mm -hmm. yeah I think too, there'd be a, a lot of potential for sand burr infestations because that's one that I think it's really challenging. And those seeds, they're so big, they don't tend to go very deep, but it can really become a, a problem that gets out of control where I could see a lot of benefit to just okay. scraping all that off, you know? Yeah, start clean because you're also removing seeds that you didn't know were there too. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I will just add to that we're going to be starting some new um, applied research here in Dallas this summer, looking at a very, very fine expanded shale as a top dressing alternative in turf systems. So I'm excited about that. Um, and so we'll be kind of rolling that out in a couple of different locations. So Laura, I think we're going to do some of that at some of the Denton sites that we visited for Green oh, Pro. Cool. So cool. yeah. Yeah. Well, if you need more sites, let me know. Oh, I will. I'm sure I'll be in touch. So yeah, I like um, your description of expanded shale as a clay popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's probably one of the more common questions we get at this time of year is what to top dress with and what's the best thing to top dress with. And a lot of folks do ask about sand. So, you know. yeah. Hey, um, Carlos, do you want to talk a little bit about what you're going to be talking about next week? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I guess uh, I'm uh, I'm sharing the the time with uh, with Suzanne, I believe. Uh, um, but I will be talking about mites, um, a little bit about about how you know we try to identify them. They're really hard to identify the different groups, uh, and and so we we kind of tend to look at the symptoms sometimes of the of their infestations, um, and and just uh, some uh, best management practices for. Uh, for spider mites in particular, but other mites as well. Get, uh, it's hard to believe it's going to be hot enough for spider mites, but yeah. <laughs> always in a greenhouse though, I guess. Yeah. And as Carlos says, we'll also have uh, Suzanne Wainwright on and she's going to talk about dipping your toe in biocontrol. So these were talks that we wanted to have actually last month, but they fell uh, right in the middle of our winter storm that we got. So we weren't able to do them that week, but we're going to fortunately get to go back and revisit them now. And they may end up being almost more timely in some ways. So um, I think it'll be great. So please join us next week for that. And uh, I think that's all, all we've got. And yeah, so we'll go ahead and, and say farewell. And thanks to you all for joining us today. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. See ya. Thank you. Good to see you again. Bye.